Good. Well, thank you all for joining. Uh, we definitely see a lot of people with interest in this topic. So thank you all for spending our, your afternoon with us or morning or evening. Uh, my name is uh, Suzette Franza. I'm a postdoc at the University of Bergen in Norway. And together with uh, Aaron O'Day, we decided to host this session about islands and islands in a more general uh, perspective. And for that, we have uh, four different uh, the four different speakers. But first of all, uh, we decided to have this session in this week of Humboldt because Humboldt, in his overview of his travels, he has been uh, visiting many different uh, island-like systems around the world, not only the different uh, islands of the Canary Islands, uh, but also Cuba and, of course, through a number of trips around the world, also visiting uh, some island-like systems that we're going to be talking about more uh, today. And definitely, he has been much inspired by a way of, let's say, a way of combining the landscape and very joyfully uh, combining what is island-like systems. So this is a, a beautiful depiction of islands or mountain configurations that look to be like in a sea, but they're actually part of a landscape. Uh, and on that, on top of that, also the mountain settings. So this is actually a very good example of, of how different island shaped formations you can find in different parts. And that definitely motivated him uh, as well. So that said, uh, first of all, we really want to uh, thank the Biogeography uh, Society for organizing this and Karen and everyone in the background for setting this up. This is a very good opportunity to display work um, and this is for us a good opportunity to join many people around around the world. Um, so that said, I'm just going to give a very short introduction of uh, the speakers. Um, maybe see if there's anything else uh, uh, pending in terms of the logistics. Um, and other than that, we can we will start very soon with uh, with the, with the different talks. So first of all, we will have Max. Uh, Max is uh, currently doing a bachelor in uh, in molecular environmental biology. He's also doing a minor in geographical information systems, and he's doing it like a combination at the University of of California in Berkeley, uh, and also doing a fellow uh, with. Aaron at his lab at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Uh, and we're very, very happy to say that Max is truly an early career researcher and probably one of the youngest or the youngest speaker that we will have during this Humboldt, Humboldt week. So we are very happy that he will, he will join uh, us. Then we will have uh, Sitze. Oh, yeah, and Max will be talking about the uh, post-glacial sea level rise and the changing shape of the isthmus of, uh, of Panama and, uh, and his work. Then we will have uh, Sitze. So Sitze, he did his uh, PhD at the University of Amsterdam. He finished this year. Uh, he's now doing a postdoc at the University of, uh, of Leiden. And he had a, a beautiful short paper last year in the Humboldt uh, uh, special issue that the Journal of Biogeography made uh, about Alex, Alexander von Humboldt. So definitely uh, very much uh, recommended. And he will be talking part of it, of course, of his PhD uh, uh, thesis, and he will be talking about uh, quaternary sea level fluctuations uh, and endemism patterns uh, on oceanic uh, islands. Uh, then we will have Juval, again, another, another country. Uh, he did his, uh, his PhD in biogeography and evolutionary ecology of, of island uh, reptiles, as you see his beautiful picture over here. Uh, supervised by, by different people from different universities. And now again, in, uh, in, in a different group in, in Germany doing his postdoc. And, uh, and he will get, give another very different perspective on island, island systems. And therefore, his title, Rethinking the Analogy uh, Between Through, Through Islands and Island-like uh, Systems. And then the fourth one in line, uh, that's me. Uh, I did my PhD at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands, now doing a postdoc at the University of, of Bergen, and I will be talking about the flickering connectivity systems of mountain islands and true islands. Uh, and with these four talks, we will have 
the wrap up of, uh, of the session of, uh, of today. So how it works a little bit in case that you haven't joined any of the, the sessions this week. So all of your, all of your cameras and, uh, and microphones are muted and off. In case you want them on, you need to send a message to, to us, the organizers, and we can turn them on. So it's a little bit different than the normal Zoom uh, meetings is that you have these buttons that you have a chat where you can post like any random comment that you have. Uh, you have the Q&A where you can post your questions about, uh, about the specifics of the, of the talk. Um, and then what we'll do is basically when we see the, 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 the question coming in, when the, the talk is over, we will raise the question to, to the speaker. But you're also very welcome to raise your hand with, with this button and then we will give you uh, the option to, uh, to ask the question directly. That's a little bit more interactive and we're, we will be very happy to, uh, to see you uh, engage in, in such a way. So it's really, really up to you. So we will have for each speaker about 15, 20 minutes uh, and then five to 10 minutes of, uh, of questions depending on, uh, on your curiosities and, uh, and uh, comments. So other than that, um, I think we're pretty much ready to go to, with, uh, with Max. Uh, but is there anything else, Aaron, that we might wanna bring up before we start? Uh, I think, Suzette, you've been incredibly comprehensive. Uh, so I don't think there's anything I can add to that. Thank you. Thanks okay. for everyone to join. Me. Wonderful. I'll, uh, I'll start screen sharing. Um, just give me a holler if you can uh, see my screen all right. Looks good to me, Max. Good luck. Good. Thank okay. you. We'll get started. Uh, well, hello again, uh, as Suzette mentioned, um, my name is Max. Uh, it's an honor to be speaking uh, with the panelists that you have before you today. Um, and I'm excited to be sharing uh, some work with you. Um, my name's, uh, oh yeah, I, I mentioned that. Uh, I'm an undergraduate at UC Berkeley um, and I'm involved uh, in the Finnegan Lab here at Berkeley and the O'Day Lab uh, at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Um, and generally, the, the goal of uh, all of our presentations today uh, is to highlight this idea of uh, flickering connectivity and isolations between these islands and island-like systems from a whole ton of different places. Um, but I would like to focus specifically um, on uh, the Isthmus of Panama. Um, and in regards to that, um, I'd like to just be highlighting uh, how post-glacial sea level rise uh, has influenced the historical uh, land connections between Panama's islands uh, and mainland um, over the past uh, 26,000 years. Um, yeah, so just jumping into some background for the paper before we get started, um, I want to highlight uh, the formation of the Isthmus of Panama paper uh, by our very own uh, O'Day et al. Um, in that paper, uh, it states that um, the Isthmus formed around 2.8 million years ago. Um, but rather than it being something that happened like all at once, um, uh, it was uh, described in the paper as a narrative of a gradually emerging land and constricting seaways. Um, and that's cool because it once again highlights this idea of flickering connectivity uh, due to sea level rise uh, going up and down. Um, and in a similar way, I focused in this project on a uh, much smaller um, but similar uh, effect of sea level rise rise on uh, coastal areas. Um, so it'll be super fun. Um, I think, and before we, I think, jump into the details um, and try, trying to understand, in trying to understand sea level rise, um, having a sea level curve that depicts those past changes uh, is super important, uh, especially in the models uh, going forward that you're gonna see. Um, so at the bottom here, um, you see the paper uh, that contains the sea level curve views throughout the rest of this presentation. Um, and it's by Miller et al. Uh, and it's super cool because it reconstructs Fenerozoic sea level change uh, using an Antarctic ice sheet. Um, and the record they have goes back millions of years. Um, and it is at thousand uh, year intervals for um, sea elevation. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a great, it's uh, super cool. Um, and I think just um, as a thing to note, going forward, uh, there is no sea level curve specifically for Panama. Um, so the sea 
uh, the sea level curves being used throughout uh, this presentation are um, a global sea level curve. Um, and it's not, um, uh, it's, it's not, there's differences between sea level data at a given time in different places. Uh, so it's not the most precise mechanism, uh, but it's, it's the best we have currently and uh, is still uh, a really useful tool uh, for the modeling uh, that we're gonna be showing you. So um, what's the project goal? Uh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, the goal is to model how post-glacial sea level rise has changed land and seascapes of the Isthmus of Panama. Uh, and why does that matter? Well, it matters because uh, it provides a ton of context for understanding uh, modern biogeography and like where organisms are spaced out uh, all around the Isthmus of Panama uh, and surrounding area. Um, and some of the stuff that we wanted to do in this project was combine topo bathymetric data, bathymetric just meaning underwater terrain. Um, we wanted to combine that elevation data with this paleo sea level data from the Miller et al. paper I just mentioned uh, to produce these maps and videos showing coastal changes. Um, and some of the cool stuff that we expected to see and did see through this process um, was, you know, you see mountains turning into uh, islands, um, steep shorelines turning into shallow shores, and freshwater areas being connected to the ocean. Um, and that's, you know, super important to see because uh, you have uh, over 100 meters of sea level rise since the last glacial maximum that peaked around 21,000 years ago. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and what you'll see some of the work uh, in a moment. Uh, and in order to uh, achieve our goal here of creating these maps and videos showing this coastal changes, we had to use uh, GIS, Geographic Information Systems, and specifically ArcGIS Pro. Uh, and you see uh, me on the right uh, with the owner and founder of ArcGIS Pro uh, in front of my home at Berkeley, actually, uh, which is um, super, he was there for a conference with E.O. Wilson. Um, so I got to meet him and I'm very proud of it. Um, but we'll keep going here. Um, and so uh, I'm going to walk you through the locations that we wanted to focus on with the modelings uh, done here. Um, so, uh, you know, the goal was to just uh, understand the connectivity between um, just like the, the main isthmus of Panama and its surrounding coastlines and understand like when the islands that you see around um, were actually formed. Um, and so the sites that we focused on, um, we wanted to create a lower resolution model for the entire isthmus, uh, as well as higher resolution models for two sites, um, Bocas del Toro here, and then Coiva here, um, as well as uh, the island of Ascuda de Raguas, which is um, located right off the coast of Bocas del Toro. Um, yeah. And then uh, some examples of why uh, this data for these sites specifically would be useful and why we chose them. Uh, there's a couple of reasons. Um, you know, some practical examples of research that it's applicable to uh, in the, the current current time would be, you know, there's a ton of different frog species throughout the Bocas del Toro Islands. Um, so understanding when those islands were connected to each other or the mainland uh, is significant. Um, understanding separations of pre-Columbian populations uh, on the coastlines of Panama um, is, is a, a good a good practical use, as well as um, the isolation of uh, tool using capuchin monkeys from their non tool using uh, capuchin uh, monkey friends uh, on the mainland. Um, so just some examples of, of uh, why it could be useful for current research. Cool. Um, so uh, Data sources. This is an overwhelming slide, so I'll walk us through it. Um, there's a lot of data sources that went into this project. Um, and, uh, as you can see from the right hand uh, photo uh, shown here, um, before, you, before, before you use the sea level curve that we were discussing a moment ago, uh, knowing like where the ocean uh, bottom is is important. Uh, and so having like a digital elevation model or a D for uh, the bathymetry around Panama uh, is super important. Um, and so there's a ton of uh, work that went into data collection for the project. Um, I want to point out uh, here, uh, in this photo, you have uh, this black mass in the middle. Uh, once again, that's, that's the Isthmus of Panama. Uh, and then down here, you have uh, the start of Colombia in South America, and then Costa Rica shown up here. All surrounding it is bathymetric data. Um, the blue streaks 
there's two sorts of bathymetric data shown here. The blue streaks are multi-beam bathymetry provided to us from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association. Um, and then the maps shown throughout are historical bathymetry from two sources, uh, the UK Hydrographic Office, as well as the Thomas Guardia Geographic Institute in Panama City, uh, in Panama. Um, so the multi-beam bathymetry shown is pretty far off the coastline, so not super useful for um, the coastal uh, the, the coastal modeling that we were doing. Um, so our main reliance for this project was on uh, this historical bathymetry. Um, and you can find global bathymetry uh, online as resources like such as GEBCO, um, but far too low resolution to be used um, for the type of modeling we're doing here. Um, yeah, and I, uh, this is like millions of points that you're seeing on the right hand side, especially with the multi-beam. So it's a, a lot of data. Um, and fun fact about the terrain, before, the terrain data shown here, it's, from, it's 30 meter cell size from the uh, NASA uh, shuttle radar topography missions um, a few decades ago. Uh, and it used to be top secret because it was used for missile uh, pro um, projectiles um, by the government. So it used to be uh, far too high quality to be shared, uh, but now it's open access. So it's super fun for everyone who loves GIS. And so uh, just our, our methods, um, I'm just gonna jump into uh, sharing um, yeah, pretty straightforward the process that we use to create the digital elevation model uh, shown here. Um, all of our historical bathymetry was geo-referenced into ArcGIS Pro relative to Panama. Um, and all of the depth points that you see on the maps were all converted to individual points in ArcGIS Pro with an assigned depth. Um, so all of the little numbers you see represent a depth for a given point. Um, once that was done, uh, we reprojected um, all of the datums to a single datum. Um, and then all of uh, the measurements used for the, the depth measurements used um, were, um, were converted to meters uh, using a, a mean low water springs reference. Um, and then following that, all of the points that you see in this middle chart right here, uh, were interpolated using uh, the geoprocessing tool of inverse distance weighting. Um, and that just uh, helps estimate um, the depth between each of the depth points that we have shown, um, just to create like a smooth digital elevation model. Um, so, and then following that, uh, we had this, you know, fluid bathymetric digital elevation model that we merged with the uh, shuttle radar topography mission, uh, NASA terrain data. Um, to create a fluid topobathymetric model of all of Panama um, and the surrounding ocean. Um, very exciting. Uh, and then here is just, uh, this is just an example of the workflow I was just discussing. Uh, you have the island of Coiba here, surrounded by this historical bathymetry. All of that was converted to points, which was then interpolated to create digital, digital uh, sorry, to create a digital elevation model, which can be used uh, in like three-dimensional um, workspaces as well, which, uh, which is super fun. Uh, yeah. And so here, uh, this is a, a big culmination of what we wanted to do with this project, um, was just create an instance-wide uh, reconstruction of the topographic and bathymetric terrain of uh, the isthmus. Uh, the light blue, so this is Panama once again, Costa Rica, uh, Colombia, um, and as you can see, the, the, the blue layer here represents uh, just the ocean uh, and then where it touches this green uh, more pronounced color is the shoreline. Um, and the legend on this right hand side uh, shows uh, elevation in meters uh, with zero being um, in reference to the modern day shoreline. Uh, and this generally this darker green represents just modern day terrain and then as you move to the lighter greens uh, that represents um, what is now covered in ocean. Uh, and these the numbers at the bottom uh, represents um, just time before present in thousands of years. And then on the right hand side, uh, you have um, sea level elevation uh, relative um, to uh, the modern day. And this is sourced from that Miller et al. sea level data curve uh, that we mentioned before. Um, and so I'll go ahead and play it. And as you see, as we move towards the present, um, the ocean fills in around the isthmus. And so islands are formed. Um, and as you see, the, as the lighter 
uh, as the color uh, becomes um, more green beneath the ocean layer, that just represents like the shallower uh, sea shelf area. And then I'm going to point out two locations in which I want to show graphs uh, going forward uh, or show other animations. We have Boca del Toro. You'll see an animation of that in a moment. And then uh, Coiba. So here we, is the Bogas del Toro region. It's uh, the same, um, uh, same conventions as the previous graph uh, mentioned. And as we move towards the present, once again, uh, ocean rises uh, and fills in um, this lower elevation flatland. Um, and you can see some of the ancient riverbeds uh, within the elevation model, which is, is pretty cool. And then here we have the island of Coiba. Same convention as the previous animations. You have peninsulas um, that turn into um, single islands in the modern day. And then, uh, so those were some of the animations that we shared just based on the digital elevation model, uh, but there are, uh, be forewarned, some caveats, of course. Um, and I think uh, one of the main uh, caveats is that we're using this modern day digital elevation model to try and understand what the ocean looks like in the past. Um, and there's some issues that come along with that. Um, one being that, uh, you know, this modern day digital elevation model of bathymetry won't represent past erosion, progradation, sedimentation, or tectonic uplift. Um, and so taking that into account in, into these models is, is important. Um, in addition, uh, the historical bathymetry used has a datum of NAD27, which uh, existed prior to the global positioning system that we have currently. Um, so it's a little, uh, it's, it's not quite as precise as uh, some of um, uh, the, you know, the technology we have today. Um, so good thing to keep a note, uh, but I think that generally uh, we assume that the time scale uh, that we're looking at is small enough um, that, uh, you know, this DEM could still be helpful um, in the, in the animations and scales that we're looking at. Um, yeah. And so what's next? Uh, on the right hand side, you see a, a sea level curve similar to the Miller et al. Uh, sea level curve that we mentioned before. It's a global sea level curve. Uh, and the reason I'm showing uh, that to you um, is because uh, as a next step, we'd like to just implement different sea level curves uh, into this model, into our models, um, to see uh, if there's any significant timing differences in terms of uh, uh, when sea levels where. Um, in addition to that, addressing the caveats mentioned just a moment ago, as well as we would like um, to give uh, a margin of error um, for each of the uh, time labels that we give. Uh, for um, each depth interval. And so what are the applications of, uh, of this? Um, there's a ton of cool stuff that you can do with uh, a digital elevation model. Uh, and one of them uh, in conjunction with a sea level curve. Uh, and one of them is uh, calculating uh, marine shelf area changes through time um, around your uh, locale of interest. Um, so here, I would just like to uh, walk us through um, walk us through this graph. Um, each color shown, um, each polygon-like color shown on the map, uh, represents a graph shown below. Uh, and you can see on the y-axis here, this represents um, sorry, this uh, this represents uh, marine shelf area. And on the uh, x-axis, we have uh, time moving towards the present uh, as you move to the right. Um, this graph here represents the lightest color blue and is the shallowest marine shelf area. This one represents like the middle color blue and that's like the intermediate uh, shelf area depth. Um, and this right graph represents the darkest blue and that represents the deepest depth interval of marine shelf. Uh, and you can see that as we move, um, I'll start playing, as we move uh, towards the present, uh, the marine shelf area in the shallow interval and the intermediate intermediate interval increases very greatly. Uh, it, it increases greatly. Uh, and you can see that 
um, as we progress towards the present. So there's a lot more uh, shallow shelf area now than there was in previous time. And so in addition to that application, there's a ton of applications that you can use with this. Um, and with that in mind, uh, we wanted to create um, freely accessible bathymetry uh, as one of the main points of this project. Um, and so you can find it ready to use and citable uh, via our Smithsonian FigShare uh, shown here, as well as these two other websites, which I'll share a link for in a moment. And then I'd like to give some special thanks uh, to uh, Milton Solano, who's a Stride GIS specialist uh, in Panama. He's like incredible GIS master, super kind uh, and um, uh, helpful throughout this whole project. He was um, a collaborator throughout the process uh, and taught me uh, so much um, about GIS. Um, yeah, one wonderful uh, human being and GIS expert. Uh, as well as thank you to Steve Patton, uh, Stuart Redwood, uh, all of our data sources, the O'Day Lab, uh, and then, of course, Aaron O'Day uh, for being a wonderful uh, PI and mentor uh, throughout, um, throughout my time of being involved uh, with the Smithsonian. And then here are references, and um, we're open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max, for giving that presentation. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Aaron O'Day. Um, we're taking questions for Max uh, on Max's presentation at the moment. If you have your question, if you have a question, remember you have two options. You can type your question in the question and answers button at the bottom, or you can raise your hand in at which point we can allow you to talk and ask your question directly to Max as you, as you prefer. Um, so the, a question has come in Max for you from Richard Field, who is asking to what extent can you assume that present day Topo bathymetric elevation has remained constant over the 21,000 year time period. And how much do you think it matters if that elevation has changed, for example, through isostatic processes, tectonics, etc.? Thanks for your question, Richard. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And that's, um, that is one of the things that we'd like to take into account. Uh, going forward as we improve the models. Um, it's, I think it's important to note that um, the margin of error for um, using topo bathymetric elevation from the modern day uh, increases the farther you go back in time. Um, so that, um, that, 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 that those error bars just uh, increase as you go back. Uh, and in addition to that, um, it's, it's, not, um, it's not like a homogeneous landscape of error. Um, at a given time. Uh, for certain areas in Panama, you have uh, much flatter regions, which uh, have a lot, a lot higher percentage of sedimentation uh, deposition, uh, where some areas might have more erosion. Um, so it really depends on uh, the areas uh, in which you're looking at. Um, so for that reason, um, if you're looking at like uh, the scale of like a small bay, um, the size of like a community, uh, this model would not be as effective for understanding what it looked like um, 20,000 years ago. But if you're looking on the regional scale of islands um, and just large scale shorelines, um, we, have, we, we think we feel it's a pretty good approximation. Um, and obviously there's a lot more data um, that could be inputted to this, um, but uh, we, we did the best we can had with uh, the data available uh, and we hope to improve it. And if you have other ideas for how to do so, um, or ways in which the data could be used, uh, we're absolutely open um, to uh, any, any suggestion. Super, thanks Max, thanks for the question as well. There are a couple of people that would like to ask questions directly. First of all, we have a question from Darko Cotoras, uh, who would like to ask a question. Please go ahead. Hi Max, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, great presentation and thank you for putting together this resource. It will be so useful to answer so many different things. Thank you so much. So my question is a more geologic question and it really calls my attention looking at your animations, the amount of continental shelf in the Pacific coast of the isthmus. It's, it calls my attention because if you look at other subduction zones like west coast of North America, west coast of South America, the slopes tend to be very steep in comparison to the east coast of North America or the east coast of South America. Now the west, the Pacific coast of Panama 
it's also a subduction zone where cocos is going underneath the, the Caribbean plate. So why there's so much shallow area over there in comparison to the Caribbean? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you. I think uh, we happen to be very lucky because we have uh, the author of the formation of the Isthmus of Panama paper with us uh, as a panelist. Um, so if Aaron, uh, if you wanted to speak to that, Emma, that would be uh, amazing. Uh, and thanks, Max. <laughs> um, I, I am not a ge geologist uh, in that sense. I really don't think I'll be able to answer. It's kind of intriguing that the, I think, I seem to remember discussing this with um, uh, a couple of geophysicists who were mentioning the, the, the angle of subduction of the Pacific plate on the Panama was much less steep than the rest of the Americas, and that might account for why that why that is so, but I, I think we'll probably need a geophysicist. Uh, hopefully there's one in the audience that can stand up and uh, help us out here. Uh, if not, then let's move on to the next uh, question. Thank um, you. Sorry, we can't answer your question, Darko, but thank you very much for the question. Maybe thank we could you. discuss it later. The next question is from Francisco Mendez. Uh, please go ahead, Francisco. Hi, Max. Thanks a lot for the nice talk. My question is about the accuracy of the method. Uh, one really important component of isolation is the temporal part, beside the, the, the space or distance dimension. And if you want to make a guess uh, and, to, and to see the strength of this isolation, for example, in traits, functional traits of plants or animals, to see uh, for how long isolation has been putting pressure to these organisms, Will be it reliable to use this approach to, to find the age of the island or a proxy? Yeah, I, I think that's it, that's definitely an interesting uh, it, it's it's an interesting question to to ask for all of the endemic species um, throughout Panama, like the three-toed pygmy sloth, like on the scuda de Braguas, or like um, like the variety of frogs in Bocas. Um, I think I think it this wouldn't be like the perfect approximation to be used um, like as like the end all be all. Um, I think you could pair it with like environmental genetics um, and like see um, like how far like I think I think like in implementing some genetic methods in addition um, to to using this as a proxy uh, I think would be um, would be like the next the next step. Um, although I'm I'm a, by no means an expert. Um, on, uh, on like the alternative methods uh, in, in determining uh, when the speciation occurred. Um, but we, we hoped that this would be um, like an added tool for someone trying to answer those questions. So maybe this will be like a starting point, like a, a guessing for when this, the island were like isolated and then we can like double check with not other te techniques as you mentioned for molecular biology and also for, I don't know, uh, uh, phylogenetics or something, this kind of approach to be sure. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I think I think in this case, um, this would be a good starting point, maybe of of, of like where to look for the fossils that you want, um, or, or where that coastline might have been, uh, and then doing more research from there. Um, I think would definitely be be necessary. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Thanks, Francisco. We have a couple of more questions come in, Max, uh, typed questions, which I'll read out to you now. The first one is from Catherine Vino, who asks, it's, is it possible to use these models to estimate the sea level changes of, in deep time, such as during the Oligocene and Miocene? Um, I think that would be like super cool. Um, but I, I think again, like your margin of error increases the farther you go back in time. Um, so I think just to keep things reliable, um, this wouldn't be the best approach for going that far back in time. Um, because at that point you have like a ton of, um, you, you have a ton of, uh, thing, other factors going in, um, that I think would make things a little too messy, um, for, for this approach. Um, but yeah, great question. I think we would like to, but we'd have to, uh, come up with some, some other things to throw in. And the next question is from Laurent Husson, who asks uh, something which maybe I will be able to answer if you can't, Max. 
Following up on this, do you know what the uplift rate is of the Isthmus of Panama? And yeah, I think I would pass that on to you, yeah. It's actually an interesting question related to one of your caveats about how much that uplift rate might affect your models. Um, we, I think we looked into this, didn't we, Max? And we found, we calculated that at the fastest uplift rates, which is actually variable spatially, um, you would probably uh, account for four or five meters difference if it was at the fastest rate that we've had in the geological past. So uh, it could be significant on the smaller scales, but on the regional scale, it's, it's probably not too much of a trouble. Thanks for the Thank question. For the we question. have another, we have one more question, I believe, Max, um, from Sebastian Sosian, who is going to talk uh, directly to you with a question. Uh, hello, Max. Uh, thank you hello. very much for, uh, for the presentation. You are so enthusiastic. I'm, I'm, I'm very thrilled to hear you. And um, my question, actually, it's, it's not a question. It's more of, um, of a suggestion on the fact that you were talking that the more you go back in time with these data, the more you get in a higher uncertainty. So my question would be, did you consider using uh, data from, uh, from paleontology colleagues, from, um, from colleagues that are, um, that are basically studying speleothems in, in paleoclimatology? I have some friends that they are basically cutting uh, speleothems and they are looking at the oxygen isotopes ratios in order to understand the, the, the sea level fluctuations in caves. And uh, this might be um, a useful addition to, to the models eventually to um, yeah, to, to manage those uncertainties in order to be able to go back in time. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that would be, um, I, th I think that's, that, I think like th that, that's the I, I, uh, like ideal scenario going forward with this uh, type of modeling um, is that you have people weighing in uh, who have like that raw data from uh, like doing cores uh, or collecting the oxygen isotope data. Um, like doing that kind of stuff, uh, and then pairing that with um, it's just like a like a localized sea level curve, um, or creating a sea level curve based on uh, like that data that you're collecting. I think um, would be like ideal. Um, I'm still I I, have, I think I have a ways more to go. I have to finish my undergraduate first, um, but I think those are questions that I'd like to help tackle. Um, and or, or pass it off to someone else um, that would be better fitted to answer those questions. Um, yeah, great, all the yeah, best yeah. for the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you, Sebastian, for your question. And thanks, Max, again, that was, you know, your enthusiasm is infectious and uh, it's a great talk to start off with. So um, with that, I think um, we'll, I'll, we'll leave it up to Suzette to introduce the next uh, presenter. Thanks a lot, Max. Thank you. Yeah, the the next one I'm I'm sure will also level his enthusiasm for uh, for islands. Uh, there's not much much more I can add to that. So please, uh, Sitsa, if you could go ahead. Hi everybody, how are you doing? Can you see my screen? Yeah. Oh, okay. And, and my flower. I thought I thought everybody in uh, Karen's key quarantine can uh, well would benefit from some uh, from some virtual flowers so that's why I put them on so and I'm very uh, thankful for Max for taking all the tough questions so uh, then I can just uh, continue uh, with uh, with my story so um, yeah so Seth already introduced me a little bit um, I I, uh, I recently uh, finished my PhD and I'm now uh, doing a postdoc at the uh, University of Leiden and so this talk will be about uh, quaternary sea level fluctuations and animism patterns on oceanic islands. And, uh, but uh, I thought, okay, because I recently uh, finished my uh, dissertation, uh, uh, of which the title was Island Biogeography in the Anthropocene and Quaternary, I thought I'd sneak in some, some more uh, recent stuff as well. But then Suzette said, oh, maybe talk more about the sea level. So if there's time, I'll talk about other things, but otherwise I'll just, I promise you said that I'll stick to the, to the sea level stuff. So, um, 
So um, yeah, and we already saw uh, Humboldt. Uh, he was a person with a really broad interest. He was not only looking at uh, at uh, a geophysical part of the landscape, also at the living things, uh, but also, of course, uh, uh, how these uh, things change over time, and also uh, to the human aspects. So uh, yeah, this was my uh, my bridge from Humboldt to my own uh, fascination. So during my PhD, I wanted to study the interaction between these uh, three things over time. And of course, uh, these human activities were added only recently. So I don't know if there's time for a, a short poll, but uh, uh, when, I, when I give a, a, a talk, I sometimes ask, okay, who of you knows uh, which island this is? And maybe you, if you know it, you can put it in the chat. I don't know, I, I, I can't see the chat now, but... Um, but, um, okay, maybe someone guessed right. So yes, it's, it's Pangea. Uh, 225 million years ago, all continents uh, were merged into one big island called uh, Pangea. And I'm using this as a, as a metaphor to illustrate what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm studying islands as, as model systems to understand um, ecosystems uh, and uh, uh, species distribution patterns uh, at, uh, at wider scales. So uh, from the past towards the present and, uh, and maybe also a little bit towards the future. So as I said, my uh, PhD thesis was about island biogeography in Anthropocene and Quaternary. Um, and I was mainly interested to understand how human environment interactions on islands relate to by geographical dynamics over longer time scales. Uh, but here I will then mainly focus on uh, the extent to which present day biodiversity patterns on islands uh, have been shaped by past uh, geographical dynamics. And if there's time, I'll talk about the human stuff. So uh, as we, we've seen in, in, in Max's talk, the earth is, is really dynamic. Um, only uh, 20,000 years ago, during the last glacial maximum, we could walk from, from Tasmania to New Guinea, from from uh, the Netherlands to, to Ireland, uh, the world uh, really uh, looked different. Uh, the um, uh, islands were much larger, the continents were much larger, and also many islands were much uh, better connected. So much research has focused on, on this, this period. And uh, I think this, it's relevant in, in shaping current species distributions. But another way to look at this is to realize that uh, both these uh, situations, the present day and the last glacial maximum, are uh, two extremes. Um, uh, if you look uh, at uh, the quaternary, so the last uh, 2.6 million years, uh, we see uh, that, that, that really the amplitude of these sea level fluctuations uh, has increased over, over time towards the present. So today we are extremely, um, islands are extremely small and isolated. And 20,000 years ago, islands were extremely large um, and, uh, and connected. So, but for most of the time, sea levels were in between those extremes. So, so uh, when I started with this, um, as, as Max, during my, uh, my bachelor's, this, these ideas were all really, really fake. So, but we thought, okay, maybe just uh, start with one uh, test case that we can understand. So we looked at uh, the Canary Islands and compared uh, two island pairs, uh, Fuerteventura and Lanzarote, that were uh, connected during the last glacial maximum, and uh, Tenerife and uh, Gomera that were never connected. So we saw that that um, uh, that Fuerteventura and Lanzarote share a significantly larger number of insect species than the other island pair that was never connected. And also, if you looked at plant species, and we compared all possible island pairs. We found that that uh, that this was uh, was really uh, the proportion of uh, uh, multiple island endemics uh, shared by by these two islands were, was really much larger than for all other islands island pairs. So then uh, we came up with uh, with uh, a model to to explain this and do, and also come up with some uh, hypothesis and we we called it uh, the glacial sensitive model. We worked on this with uh, with uh, many uh, different colleagues, and uh, basically, uh, what we proposed: if we if we compare um, uh, two islands, and and we think about uh, islands uh, that did not change much 
in, in size as a result of sea level fluctuations and were never connected, will have a smaller proportion of endemic species uh, compared to those islands that were connected to other islands or that were much larger in the past. As you can uh, understand, uh, with a certain drop in sea level, each island responds very differ differently based on uh, as a result from differences in uh, bathymetry, as, uh, as Max uh, showed. So, and then uh, we were interested to study how these uh, sea level fluctuations over time affected uh, modern uh, biodiversity. Then I realized, I promised Suzette I will not show this, so I, I will skip. But the, the basic idea is that, um, as I said in the beginning, uh, not uh, each sea level stand is, is you could say, equally uh, common. Some are really exceptional or, or uh, persist for only uh, a short uh, period of time, while others uh, are more representative of the quaternary. But of course, to understand how these uh, changes in sea level and resulting change in archipelago configuration and, um, and, uh, and, and uh, island area and connectivity, how these changes affect modern biodiversity, we first had to quantify how islands uh, change over time. So uh, I developed a, a R script to, to do uh, these calculations uh, at a global scale. So this, um, this R script is it's published with, uh, with, uh, with the paper. You can download it um, um, and, and run it for your own uh, data. But uh, I had the basic idea, um, for, so to give you one example, so we also published this as a, as a data set for 200 islands um, across the globe, uh, how they changed over time. And we used that as, as um, Max already showed, okay, there are different uh, sea levels that you might use. So we used uh, two different sea levels. So one is uh, Lambeck et al, another one is Cutler et al. Um, and I'm showing here, uh, um, uh, the graph for based on, on Lambeck et al. Um, but you can use, in, if you download the script, you can use any sea level curve uh, you might like to use. And of course, uh, if you have a local sea level curve, use that one. Um, so, but uh, I had to give you an example here for the Ventura and Lanzarote again. Uh, here below you see uh, the Canary Islands. It might not be so visible uh, on, on your screen because it's, it's quite small. But, but you can see that, uh, for example, um, uh, Tenerife and, and, um, and uh, Gran Canaria. So today, um, Tenerife is uh, the largest island, but for, uh, only recently this uh, was uh, reversed during the last glacier maximum. So uh, you can, with this uh, script, you can um, calculate these kind of curves and, and these maps for, for all islands across the globe. And we are now uh, working on an R package. Uh, so to uh, make it easier to use this. Uh, but as, as uh, Max already said, there are a lot of issues with this. If you think about uh, 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 the geology, uh, so of course uh, the next step will be to, to um, do this at, at, uh, also at the island basis. And I think these are really two complementary approaches. So what I just showed was a, a global database. And of course your resolution uh, will be coarse because you ignore many things. Um, but the other way is to look at individual islands, and that's uh, really a lot of work. So recently we published this paper for uh, Terceiro in which we quantified the relative contribution of uh, volcanic activity and, um, and sea level fluctuations. And you, as, as you expect, of course, this effect of sea level fluctuations is much more um, uh, gradual, uh, but, but has a, a large uh, overall effect, while um, uh, volcanic activity comes mainly in bursts. But uh, that aside, uh, so now with this uh, global database, we, this allowed us to, to, um, uh, to assess the relationship with these um, archipelago uh, dynamics uh, and, and its relationship with uh, modern biodiversity patterns. So uh, we tested this for, um, for 53 islands across the globe uh, in, in um, in, uh, in, in 12 different archipelagos. And we did this for, for angiosperms, so flowering plants, and also for uh, land snails. And, and this is what we found. So um, 
here on the on in the the blue bars you see the single endemic species and in the, the green bars the, the native non-endemic species on the y-axis you see the standardized uh, coefficients and on the x-axis you see uh, the different uh, predictors that were used in the models so uh, uh, current area current isolation area change uh, uh, relative to a certain uh, period in the past and uh, paleo connectedness so what I show here is only um, the best model uh, that emerged from a model selection uh, procedure. Uh, if you want to read about that, you can read it in the paper. But um, but uh, so the, the, I'm just showing a selection of, of all the uh, models. Uh, but the striking thing is that um, if you look at the single endemic species, you see that um, the modern their modern distribution is uh, better explained if you also include uh, past archipelago configuration. So uh, area change and uh, paleo connectedness uh, really are important for both land snails and angiosperms. But if you look at the native non-endemic species, they are only explained by modern uh, conditions. So that, that's really striking. Yeah? If you think about this uh, patterns of single island endemic species, they are better explained by a situation in the past than they are by uh, current conditions. So, but then uh, what conditions? Because uh, the, we have seen these sea levels have changed all the time. So what do we take as a reference uh, uh, time, a reference period? So uh, here I, I try to um, visualize uh, the results in a, in a conceptual uh, figure. So. Uh, one is the sea level persistence. So for how uh, much uh, percentage of the time um, was the sea level at a certain uh, sea level stand? Um, corresponding to those sea levels, uh, you had uh, uh, certain archipelago configurations. So um, some were really short lasting, like, uh, like the situation that we are in now uh, with the, the high um, interglacial sea level and also the uh, glass glacial maximum, for example, was a, a really was a short lasting and exceptional. For most of the time, archipelago uh, configurations were at these intermediate levels. So now let's have a look at their influence on species richness. So with the, the width of the bars indicate uh, their imprint, the imprint of these uh, situations in the past on, on uh, modern uh, uh, species distributions. And you see that single island endemics, as well as non-endemic natives, they can be explained by um, modern conditions. Um, and non-endemic natives are better explained by uh, modern conditions than any uh, period in the past. Well, if you look at single island endemic species, you see that their current distributions are much better explained by these intermediate uh, archipelago configurations and not by these exceptional um, situations during the last case of maximum or uh, the present day. And again, uh, after this global um, approach, um, let's zoom into some, some specific, more specific stuff. So here's one thing I think it will be the next step is really to look at uh, individual islands and more interesting uh, archipelagos or uh, groups of islands, how they respond to uh, changes in uh, in in uh, sea level fluctuations, eh? because you can imagine that you have island specific thresholds at which islands become connected or, or separated. And um, we're now working on uh, assessing um, uh, uh, the role of these, these uh, island dynamics driven by sea level fluctuations on, um, on the diversification of, of uh, different species here, uh, uh, skinks and, and geckos in the, in the Gulf of Guinea. So how am I doing with the time, uh, Suzette? You're okay-ish, but uh, a little bit more. Okay, okay, so uh, and then uh, very briefly. So uh, then of course, uh, what, uh, what are the implications of this uh, besides understanding modern biodiversity, but also um, um, how, do, how do these changes relate to these, these modern uh, changes uh, shaped by humans because okay we know that these islands are really dynamic but and now they are really drastically impacted by uh, humans 
So how do these uh, relate to each other? So briefly, for example, here is uh, Mauritius, a case study. It has been inhabited by people for only about 400 years, which is uh, super short. But only in that 400 years, uh, nearly all of the native vegetation has, um, has disappeared. And of course, it's had a tremendous impact on the island's uh, native ecosystem. And uh, many species uh, uh, were driven to extinction. But um, also this has impacted the soil and the soil is really the foundation of, of uh, these uh, ecosystems. So over time, uh, I modeled how, um, how much soil was lost resulting from uh, human impacts relative to, to this um, uh, amount of soil loss that would have occurred on a scenario when the island would, have, uh, would not have been colonized by uh, people. And I, I found that really the amount of soil loss exceed these background rates by, by five times, which is really drastic. So this is one example of comparing um, modern uh, human uh, impacts with, with, um, with this uh, background rate. And I think also if we think about the sea level fluctuations, that, that gives us an opportunity to not only look at a kind of static baselines like pre-human, but also what was the rate of change uh, in, uh, in pre-human pre uh, times. And of course, in this sense, uh, islands are, are really uh, suitable case studies because uh, uh, there's a, a clear moment uh, when, uh, when islands were born and also a clear, relatively clear moment when uh, people arrived. So that said, um, I also found this interesting pattern and I saw that, well, I thought it, it seems that, that, that in the early years, uh, mainly the, I, the, the parts of the islands that were close to the coast in, 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 in the lower elevations were deforested first. And I was curious to see how that, uh, whether that was also the case on other islands. So um, then uh, I compared these uh, 30 islands in the Eastern Atlantic regarding different environmental conditions and different societal conditions. I'll skip this. Um, but the main finding was that, that really uh, the, 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 the landscape, so the, the physical conditions of an island really uh, affect how, uh, how much uh, of this native vegetation is still remaining. So it really shows that, 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 the, that the, the landscape of an island and the, and the environmental history of an island really shapes also the interactions with, uh, with, with people. And, uh, and to be more specific, so uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in the statistical model, I, I compare different environmental and climatic conditions and really uh, the ruggedness of an island really is a, a major uh, explanatory variable in, in, in uh, explaining differences between islands in terms of the native vegetation that is uh, still remaining. So uh, I, I rushed a bit the human aspects because I, that's what I promised, but then, okay, just to, to, to summarize, uh, um, I think to, to understand modern biodiversity patterns, we really need to uh, consider human impacts over the past centuries and millennia and environmental dynamics over longer time scales and, and look at ways how we can integrate these different things like Humboldt did. Um, and so each island had a unique history. They are emerged at different moments in the past and distinct ecosystems formed and at different moments in, in time, uh, people arrived. So in a, in a blink of geological time, um, people transformed these landscapes, but to different extents. And how then do these relate to, to these sea level fluctuations in the past? Well, here's just one example, with, which I think we could uh, investigate further. For example, here Mauritius has showed that before. So this in, in dark gray, you see the current extent of Mauritius. In light gray, the last glacial maximum of which we know now, as I showed in the earlier, shell, the earlier slides, this was really the most extreme uh, change in area, not only over the last 20,000 years, no over say the last, um, uh, say over the quaternary. And of course, um, given this, uh, uh, of course, uh, of course, without uh, in including uh, geological dynamics, but only the sea level fluctuations. But this gives us a way of, of comparing modern rates of human impact with those long-term dynamics, rather than just a static situation. 
And so this happened in, in 20,000 years. It's a really extreme situation over the last millions of years. And this of, of the whole island being governed by native vegetation up till this situation where there's only 2% of native vegetation left happened in only 400 years. So uh, yeah, that was what I wanted to tell you. So uh, please uh, feel free to ask any questions. Thank you, Sitsa. That was really, really nice, and uh, and thank you for adding the extra, the human, uh, the human touch to uh, to the presentation. So we've got uh, two questions. Uh, one is by uh, Darko again. Uh, I will allow to talk. Uh, Hi, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, congrats. Super interesting talk. And part of my question, you partially answered it already with the human aspect but but i would still like to hear if you can comment more on this so at some point you did model testing to see what could explain single island endemics or natives and if we look at low elevation areas which are the ones that expand with the changes on with sea level those areas are inhabited by species that are subject to high rates of extinction as you explained before so those changes we, what we can measure today would be really um, a biased view of what really existed at that elevation. Now, if you consider high elevation habitats where you could find more endemics and many of the islands that you use, like Hawaii, Galapagos, they do have high elevation with cloud forest or different types of habitats. For those species, really changes on sea level don't matter because they don't go below, like in Maui Nui, if you are in Haleakala or West Maui, it doesn't matter you have water or land below. So how do you incorporate these two things, these two elements, high extinction rates at lower level, a lower elevation, and low extinction rates, but independence of what happened at the lower elevation for high elevation species? Hey, uh, thanks a lot uh, for your question. Um, so, of course, uh, this, uh, what we know of the past is always imperfect. But uh, I think there are two ways that we can uh, do our best to address uh, this um, question. So uh, again, as I did in the, in the rest of the talk, I gave you examples of, of uh, individual islands or individual archipelagos and uh, global um, approaches. So for example, in, in this, this uh, paper from 2014, we try to cover it uh, in this way. So we looked at the um, uh, uh, number of uh, shared species uh, across the whole island and also uh, um, only below uh, 500 meters. So, and, and we, we found, uh, we still found uh, the same effect. So here, um, uh, um, I think that, that, that is, that is, um, uh, we address that in that way here. So to, to make this elevation sonation in, in terms of uh, comparing uh, shared species. And then in, in our other uh, study in which we um, uh, compared uh, these uh, 50 islands uh, uh, globally, um, we uh, did our best uh, at least for, for, for the land snails uh, while constructing the database to include uh, extinct species. And of course, snails uh, are easier for that because, um, well, the chance of, of, of preserving uh, uh, their shells is, is, um, is higher. So that's, that, that's what's, what's making it easier to include um, uh, recently extinct species uh, as a result of human activities. But uh, as, you, as you rightly uh, point out, um, this is uh, in, imperfect, but this is how we uh, did it. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Darko. Thank you. Yeah, we had a, a similar question from uh, from Hanneke Meyer about how to include the, the the fact that what we see today has this legacy of extinction. So how do we kind of it, reconstruct it back? But I think you did a very, very good job of saying, that, well, there's one approach that can be used to kind of, kind of try to pull back uh, what it has been, uh, right? Yeah. Okay. So we've got a, another question from Brittany. Um, have you found that these different differing patterns between endemic native species versus non-endemic native species been driven by past connectedness are consistent between latitudes or is there variation? 
Um, so that's a good uh, question. So what is your uh, why? Why do you? Uh, why is this your hypothesis? Is this because uh, the sea level is not uh, constant globally, or do you have another idea? I'm not sure, Brittany. Ah. Yeah. No, you have to. Oh, okay. So well, then, then uh, the short. Oh. So okay. Sorry. So so the question was uh, whether we uh, checked whether um, the role of um, uh, isolation and. Um, um, no, so you have you, you compared those uh, and nate, endemic native versus non-endemic natives, and do, yeah, yeah. do, do you right. see differences across latitudes, or is there a variation? Um, can you hear me now? Ah, yeah. yeah. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Um, no, I, I suppose like more. I guess it's a long time scale thing, but more from a point of view of like glacial history um, and like weather connectedness, because obviously at lower latitudes you're going to have like theoretically. I mean, sea level rise is a different thing, but like at higher latitudes, you are going to have more connectivity in terms of like ice. And I just wondered if there was any kind of pattern that you could see from that. Mm. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, that's, those are the nicest questions that you have to think about uh, for a longer time. So, um, so we, so we did um, um, uh, assess. Um, whether um, so the, the pattern we found was was really on on, on islands uh, globally uh, but um, the role I think so one one, one so the thing is that um, we are talking about oceanic islands here so we deliberately focused our study only on oceanic islands and um, so what you if you think about um, Oceanic islands. It's also a bit the topic of this session. So, if you think about different island systems, also as a bridge to the next uh, talk, maybe um, uh, they respond differently to sea level fluctuations. So, if you just bulk everything on the same uh, heap, uh, oceanic uh, systems and continental systems, um, continental systems respond really differently uh, to to uh, drops in sea level fluctuations as you as you might expect if sea level drops in a continental system you have a certain like I think if you think about the Seychelles for example you have a drop in sea level and like the whole micro continent emerges while in uh, oceanic islands this this will not be so drastic because they, they, these are uh, they are they are volcanoes so the, the role of, of connectedness is not so uh, so strong as in, in uh, oceanic uh, systems yeah Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Brittany, to, uh, to come help uh, jump in. So uh, time-wise, I think it's good that we now go to the next speaker. So Sietze, thank you very much, and also for everyone for posing your, your questions. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Juval, if, if you're ready, then you can uh, go ahead. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Good, okay. Uh, so thanks. Um, the org I want to thank the organizers for this uh, session. I think it's really fascinating and I'm happy um, this issue is, is being discussed, this, this uh, analogy between true islands and island-like systems. And uh, my goal today is to try and make uh, everyone that attends this session to think a little bit about this comparison. So islands, the, this fascinating, uh, systems, the natural laboratories that have um, inspired the greatest of uh, naturalists to develop their theories um, are really a center uh, of, or, or a focus of biogeography. And actually 50 or 60 years before Darwin uh, published The Origin of Species, this man, uh, the one we are honoring uh, this week, whose full name is Friedrich Wilhelm Heinrich Alexander von Humboldt, according to Wikipedia. He traveled through South America and he um, um, uh, sailed through the Orinoco River uh, between Venezuela and Colombia. And he saw these great outcrops just uh, on the banks of the rivers and uh, in 1827, he wrote the following. Uh, 
um, the right I can see uh, okay so um, the valley which uh, runs in a straight line from uh, south to north from Kamehi to Tuparo is filled with granitic and solitary mounds all resembling those which are found in the shape of islands and those in the right, and those in the present bed of the river I was struck with this analogy of form on comparing the rocks Kelly and Oko situated in the deserted bed of the river west of Maipures with the islets of Oita Valley and Kamini Tamini which rise like old castles amid the cataracts uh, to the west of the Bishan. So he already acknowledged back then the potential of this analogy. And if you look closely at this picture, you see this outcrop actually on the background. Uh, quite a lot of time later in the 60s, uh, MacArthur and Wilson, uh, some would call them the fathers of the island biogeography, wrote their uh, synthesis, their seminal synthesis. Uh, this graph is probably the most famous uh, of this work, um, showing that uh, species richness decreases uh, with isolation and increases with island area. And in 1967, they wrote the following. Insularity is moreover a universal feature of biogeography. Consider, for example, the insular nature of streams, caves, gallery forest, tide pools, taiga as it breaks up in tundra and tundra as it breaks up in taiga. The same principles apply and will apply to an accelerating extent in the future. The formerly continuous natural habitats now being broken up by the encroachments of civilizations. So they also recognize the potential of this analogy between true islands and other systems that have insular characteristics. Now, like all these great minds, uh, that I mentioned, and probably most, if not all of uh, the attendees here, I love islands. This is why I spent four years uh, of field work in the islands of Greece. I was looking uh, to catch these little guys, and sometimes I even managed to do so. And my time on the Greek islands um, led me to think about the concept of island. What is island? What are islands? So geographically, islands are land masses surrounded completely by water. It could be seawater or uh, fresh water, um, but biologically, what are they? And I think that for every isolated habitat out there, you will find the biologist calling it an island system. And the diversity is really immense. There are terrestrial uh, systems like uh, these mountain tops, the inselbergs, the caves. There are freshwater systems like lakes and hot springs marine systems like hydrothermal vents and marine caves, and also quite a lot of uh, systems uh, made by men. And here uh, I give a few examples for these. And this is a really widespread uh, uh, practice to, to call isolated habitats, islands. Just three hours ago, uh, I heard uh, Dr. Benjamin Rice gives a great talk about uh, parasites in Madagascar and how their hosts serve uh, as islands for these parasites. But the question is, are island-like systems equivalent to true island uh, biologically? And I will give you the answer right now. They partly are. Um, however, most available evidence uh, support more uh, show that more differences exist than similarities, and I will not go into details uh, of the different uh, subjects, so uh, species richness and endemism and genetic diversity and species composition, uh, but you can read them in this paper. What I want to do now is to more conceptually, to, to keep the discussion in a conceptual level, and elaborate a little bit about the uh, characteristics of these different systems and the similarities and dissimilarities in the characteristics that actually affect the differences uh, and similarities in the patterns, biological patterns of these systems. And the fundamental question here is 
can we even compare these uh, systems? Are we comparing apples and apples or uh, are we comparing apples to oranges? So there are several features that every insular uh, system uh, shares, either islands or island-like systems. Uh, the first one is partial fragmentation. You've got uh, units of the habitat that are not connected to each other. The second one is that each of these units has a limited area. Um, then these units are uh, separated from each other, isolated from each other, both spatially and temporally. And the connectivity between them is low. All of these features are shared by, by all uh, types of insular systems. But there are quite a lot of uh, differences and I want to touch the several that I think are uh, the most important. So the most basic is the island form. Um, so islands, true islands by definition are terrestrial uh, systems surrounded by water as I said before. But island like systems vary quite a lot and as I mentioned, there are terrestrial systems, freshwater systems, marine systems, and even biological uh, forms that serve as islands like the host of parasites or this nice uh, sea turtle that serves as an island to the for the sedentary uh, fauna uh, that travels with it uh, through the sea. And these uh, forms have different characteristics and they affect the uh, biological uh, um, patterns uh, in them. The next one is the metrics and the uh, contrast between the system and the metrics. So this contrast is what determines at the end uh, the level of isolation. Uh, this can be uh, either geographical or physiological. So if you look at the uh, thermal uh, pool from Yellowstone on the right side. Um, this is a case where uh, both types of barriers or contrast uh, exist because there's a physiological uh, contrast because of the uh, thermal difference and also uh, geographical uh, difference from the water to the terrestrial habitat that surrounds it. Uh, but uh, not all taxa are equally isolated within systems. So on the left side, you can see the birds that easily go from one island to, to another. But if you uh, look at a gecko, it's harder uh, for it to, to move between these islands. The mainland is also uh, an important feature. It's the main uh, pool of species and genes that is available for an island. And it has a central uh, role in many theories of island biology. Uh, but in some uh, systems, uh, especially island-like systems, the mainland and the metrics are actually the same. So this is what you see on the right side, uh, where the metrics of the Kilimanjaro is the lowland. Uh, and also that's the source of uh, of uh, species and genes uh, for what's living on the mountain. Then you have the system origin and uh, there are two main types. So we have the de novo systems, which are islands that rose or emerged through the uh, metrics and weren't there uh, before. And when they emerge there, they don't have any uh, life on them and it uh, and and they're colonized by uh, species and the second uh, type is the fragment systems these are uh, pieces of previous uh, land or previous systems that were uh, split by the contrasting metrics and now the the uh, fauna and flora that was already there is isolated from uh, the fauna and flora that coexisted with it uh, previously. Then we get to island area and isolation, uh, which are probably the two most influen influencing factors uh, in island biology 
uh, theories. Uh, they, they are thought to affect pretty much all uh, biological patterns. And in true islands, uh, island area is a clear, uh, clear cut and stable uh, feature. It's easily uh, measured, as you can see on the right. Um, but that's true for ecological times. And as uh, Sitze showed, uh, it fluctuates uh, uh, in geological time frames. Uh, but in island dike systems, this is quite complicated and quite dynamic. Um, so consider the vernal pools that shrink and grow seasonally. Or think of about uh, cities that develop and expand and their area is uh, growing or sometimes shrinking. Island isolation is probably the most complicated uh, characteristic. It has several components. It has spatial components, temporal components, and in, in some systems also anthropogenic components. It can be estimated from multiple sources. So from the uh, closest uh, neighboring system or from the closest larger neighboring system or from the uh, what you call mainland uh, or from a mainland where there's similar biota. So all kinds of different uh, sources that isolation can be, can be measured from. And then it's also dynamic in island-like systems. Consider again the vernal pools. When they shrink, the isolation from uh, adjacent uh, pools increases. When they grow, it decreases, so it's dynamic. And this variation in isolation indices uh, is starting to be recognized. Um, so Patrick Weigelt and Holger Kraft uh, looked at the, at the variation of, of different indices uh, in plants, and uh, they looked at spatial indices. Uh, me and my colleagues looked at, uh, at uh, both uh, spatial and temporal indices in uh, animals. And uh, Suzette will uh, talk about this, I guess, uh, next, uh, took it to the next, next level with her uh, fabulous team of uh, collaborators um, and addresses also island-like system uh, within this context. Now I want to give you uh, one example for an island-like system and how it really compares to uh, true islands. So cities have been uh, considered uh, to be insular for quite a few decades. And they are really important uh, because the world is urbanizing and, and this has really severe implications for uh, biodiversity. And also they're interesting because you can look at them in two ways. Um, so first, as you see in this map, there's cities are islands uh, in the urban archipelago. Uh, you can see the archipelago of light here. It's more obvious on the west uh, side of, the, of North America. Um, but if we zoom in, in this case, New York City, you can see all these green patches. So the green spaces within the city, and they are also considered as islands in the sea of concrete. And now let's zoom in on Manhattan, which is an island, a real island uh, in itself. And here is Central Park. And if you look closely, you see uh, other islands. So you see the, the uh, water pools and you see the lawns. And these are also a kind of insular systems. So we've got islands within islands within islands. So the, the whole system is really complex. Now let's go uh, through the different characteristics and see if we, uh, what difference we find. So if we look at true islands and urban areas, the basic form of both is terrestrial. If we look at the metrics, we see the first difference. So uh, the metrics of true islands is either freshwater or seawater but for urban areas, it's also terrestrial. Then the contrast is geographical and high for true islands, but it's geographical and low for urban areas. The mainland for true islands is the closest continent, 
but for urban areas, it's the metrics. So we've got this uh, double uh, role of the metrics as a metrics and a mainland. The system origin for true islands, it's either the novel or fragment, but urban areas are actually a combination of the novel and uh, fragment islands. Um, I gave you here the photo of uh, lovely Rio de Janeiro. You can see the natural patches that are uh, kind of fragment habitats, but also uh, other gardens or parks uh, that are not natural, and they would be the novel system. The area of true islands is straightforward to, to define and it's a stable character, but in urban areas, it's complex. You, it's really hard to say where a city uh, starts or ends. And also um, it's dynamic because cities uh, grow in most cases. And the same with isolation. So it's complex in both systems, but for true islands, it's stable in ecological times. Uh, but in urban areas, it changes quite fast. And to, uh, so at the end here, uh, we see that we're not really comparing uh, apples with apples. We're comparing apples with something that is not exactly an apple. And just to give you a, a small empirical example. So this is work I'm uh, doing right now uh, in my postdoc in Berlin. And here I look at the uh, species richness of uh, mammals in Australian cities. And I studied the uh, simple hypothesis that uh, island that um, species richness increases with city area and decreases with uh, cities isolation. But I also looked at other factors and I wanted to see what is the best model. So if I look at area and isolation, I see that cities actually follow the prediction of uh, the island uh, by geography theory. But if I look at the best model, both factors actually disappear. And what I'm left with is human population size and the potential species richness, which is actually the metrics species richness, how rich the area where the city is um, has a really strong effect. So I think that to actually uh, advance, we need to start uh, classifying different systems in a more uh, thorough way. And I developed this, uh, this uh, classification scheme, which I would love to discuss with people. Uh, and it has several components. So the, the uh, core is the, the study question and the different components of it. So the study setting, the ecological context, the ecological structure and the effective isolation. And those are affected by the organism properties and the system properties. And for each of these components, um, different character characteristics that are influenced by the properties of organisms and the systems are um, changing the, the level of insularity. Um, and I think it's really uh, good to start and try uh, classifying different systems within different contexts and see how similar and or different they really are from true islands and actually from each other. And what can we do to move forward? So I think there are several things. So first we need to acknowledge the differences between systems. Um, and this is what I'm trying to do uh, with this uh, classification uh, scheme. The next thing is to expand the scope of empirical studies. For most of these systems, there are very few empirical studies, um, perhaps not for mountains and caves, which are uh, probably the most uh, studied ones uh, from all island-like systems. Um, but also in terms of, of questions, the, the scope uh, right now is really limited to uh, the core island biogeography, so species area related relationship and stuff like that. Uh, but microevolution, for instance, and ecology are quite ne neglected in this uh, context. Then it 
probably will be useful to, to develop some kind of quantitative measures of things like the metrics contrast and permeability based on uh, the dispersal ability of, of different uh, species. Uh, so we can say how insular a system is for uh, different taxa. And then the last thing is probably that we need to discuss which similarities preclude insularity. So at what level of difference do we call a system not insular anymore. So all of these things I think will, will, uh, could develop our understanding of uh, biogeography and island biogeography uh, and also for biodiversity patterns. So here I wrap up. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I wanna thank my host in Berlin, Jonathan Jeschke uh, and my funding, uh, funding agencies uh, and I'll, be happy to take questions. Thank you, uh, Juval. Um, so we will take one question because we're running late and we don't want to miss out uh, on too many people. So was, we it got... too, uh, uh, was it too long? Oh, we were just out in time. And uh, okay. so we got Francisco Mendez, uh, who... Hey, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, uh, thank you, Val. I really admire your work. I think that you are raising the hand in a very interesting topic in biography. This is the uh, insularity of the systems, the island-like systems. I, I work with one that is really controversial, the epiphyte islands in the canopy. Mm. And now I'm working with also with the uh, island-like systems in, in, in outcrops. But what, it, what I, I want to ask you is uh, this conceptual uh, question. You think that insularity or isolation is a yes or no process? Or do you think it's more like a kind of a gradient when you, can, you have like multi-dimensional multi gradient where you can put these systems on and say, well, for some organisms or some uh, part of it or for, for some functional traits, it's more insular or less insular? What do you think about it? I think there is, so I think that it is a kind of a gradient across taxa. Um, but I also think that the, that for, um, different questions or different patterns of biodiversity, the, the gradient will look differently. Uh, and, and I think that if you, if you think of, of um, so, so the, the, the um, you know, the highest, the impact of isolation on a process, this gradient will be uh, sharper mm -hmm. um, and, and will, let's say, cut off more systems, um, I think, uh, for the same, for the same uh, taxon. Yeah, I ask this question, for, for example, because we have the, the, in, in the problem that in the canopy is hard to decide what is the threshold of the island. Is the canopy of the tree itself or the epiphyte mat within its branch? And so far, and many works have failed to find any isolation indexes or metrics that really relate to the organisms that live in there. But some others, for example, when they work at really fine scale with bacteria or with these phytotelmata organisms, well, they find. So I think that is, as you mentioned, I also agree, it's kind of a gradient of degree of insularity, but it's also, as you mentioned, taxon dependent. So I really uh, thank you for, for the nice talk and also for this very nice topic. And I hope to uh, have personal talk with you later on. I will be happy to talk with, with anyone who, who is interested in this uh, subject, actually. Thank you, Francisco. That's a very valid question. It definitely goes in, in, uh, in showing the need to understand and quantify better what, uh, uh, what insulin system is and, and how, how you can define it for different taxa and, uh, and, and uh, context and continents or any kind of, as you said, any kind of scale. I mean, you can zoom in yeah. and everything becomes isolated, right? Yeah, I said context, not continents. Yeah, sorry, context. Um, yeah. So is there any other question or someone that uh, has a final question because before you move on? No, I guess not. Okay, thank you, Joel. That was, that was really yeah. good. Uh, that was a very good thank introduction to, uh, to, to my talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The floor is yours. The floor is mine. Okay. While Suzette sets her presentation up, let me introduce her. Suzette is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bergen in Norway. 
Uh, she conducted her PhD in the University of Amsterdam. And today she will be giving us an overview of her research and insights with a talk entitled Flickering Connectivity Systems of Mountain Islands and True Islands. Thanks, Suzette. And thanks, thanks for organizing this session, by the way. I think <laughs> no, we're really grateful. Thanks. Great enthusiasm. We have a lot of participants. So I will be talking uh, today about the flickering connectivity systems and everything relates very well to what you've seen from the talks from, from Max uh, and, uh, and this, is, this is really nice. So I wanted to hook back to what Humboldt did in his, uh, in his work and he had this mastermind of drawing landscapes and you can see really see like a development in his work where he depicted all these shapes of mountains around the world. And he had a very strong background in geology. So he, he kind of shaped out all these mountains and kind of figured out how they, they all came about. Uh, and it's a very beautiful kind of example how he then kind of had that artistic, you know, depiction of how these mountains in a landscape very much assembled like, like true islands. And I think that this you could easily see like islands in the sea or mountains in a, in a landscape with all these different uh, shapes uh, uh, together. Uh, and this is of course a very, very famous one where he very elegantly uh, put next to each other, you know, big mountains instance, like the Andes and, and Tenerife Island, Himalaya and the Alps. And if you would not explain such a thing to anyone who is not familiar with his mountain, he would, you would basically think that are five different island systems next to each other. So he was, he was very flexible in kind of de depicting these mountains as if they were, you know, very uh, sort of structured like, uh, like islands as we, uh, as, we, uh, as we know it. So what I wanted to talk about today is uh, this concept of mountain islands uh, and also following a little bit on that and what, what are the, the parallels between like true islands and mountain islands. In this case, I will focus a little bit more on alpine islands and I will be talking about like the flickering connectivity systems, uh, looking into the past and how these, these uh, islands behaved in, uh, over the last uh, thousands of years. So first of the concept of mountain islands. So mountain islands is very broad. It's very confused. It's not well, very well defined, but let's say very broadly speaking, we say they're island-like systems in mountains. So that's of course extremely broad, but you can basically categorize it in three uh, rough categories, which is like the habitat islands in mountains, the sky islands and alpine islands. And these are not very well defined. They've been kind of mixed up uh, in, uh, in the literature and I will show you some examples and, and show you how they, they are different, but they're very loosely used in the literature. So in terms of first the, the example of a habitat island in, uh, in a mountain, what that could be. So a habitat island in a mountain is basically an isolated patch of a certain habitat type. So let's say an, um, uh, a biome or ecosystem or any kind of habitat uh, that, is, that is kind of uh, uh, assemblage uh, within a mountain. And a very good example of that is the seasonal dry tropical forest in uh, Latin America. So you can see, of course, they have got like large patches in, the, in, in, in like the eastern of Brazil, but also like these smaller isolated patches or islands, if you like, within the Andes and towards uh, like Colombia. So what you basically get is a patch of a certain biome, as Joel said, that is that has like this shape you know, it has restricted, it seems isolated within um, a, a different kind of ecosystem. So it has this feature of being isolated and not one big continuous uh, a system around a certain continent. So you can, as, as an example, that could be like a habitat island within, uh, within a mountain. And then sky islands. So the, the sky island concept, that's a topic that got coined already in the 40s and they they kind of they kind of announce it or kind of describe it as mountain islands in a desert sea with limited genetic exchange between them and the way that they kind of formulated it was based on the system like between arizona nevada and utah in the us uh, right right over here 
And it's basically this, this desert system all around these mountain features that you see, like all these patches over here and like these mountains over here. And when you zoom in, you can see, really see like, like these like small mountain island systems with archipelagos in this flat landscape. And it basically looks like this. You got flat and then you got like the islands, you know, mountain, island formations coming up of that. So that's where the, this concept of sky islands were, was first kind of first introduced. But the Warsaw in 1994, he basically said, well, you know, that could actually apply to many mountain, you know, systems or structures around the world. So he defined uh, 20 different sky island complexes. So these complexes, like this one is the one that it all started with, which is the famous, like the famous one in Arizona I just showed. But he said, well, you can have like different sky island types. You can have like this stepping stone archipelagos between, between mountains, or you can have like a big mountain with some outliers, or you can have like a corrigere, like a mountain system with outliers. And he, he came up with all these different examples of mountains around the world that, that, could, be, that could be considered as, as having their sky island uh, system. So I will be showing examples of these cordillera with outliers and isolated uh, sky islands. So you can have a little bit of a sense of what, of what these sky islands are. So the first one is like these, like this chain of a mountain with outliers. And two examples like the Southern Andes, where you have like these long branch of, of mountains or like in the, in, the, in the California. And then you have like these isolated sky island uh, formations. And they basically look like this long stretch. And then one of some of these isolated kind of features uh, close to it, but, but not connected. And the other one, the more famous one, the, the, those more isolated features are like the tabletop mountains around South America um, that have uh, that cover a number of different countries uh, and also in, in India. And when you see these, you can really see the shaping as if it would be uh, an island, like a flat landscape and uh, a really prominent uh, um, horizon in, in, in the landscape. So this actually, this actually made it easier for uh, the confusion to start about sky islands because sky islands initially were, it was just based on the geology. So it was based on this topographic feature, but actually, through time, it became also like this link to uh, uh, habitat features in mountains in terms of the alpine islands. So it was first more like a geology thing. And then through time, it be became also more like an ecological, biological feature uh, to describe uh, a sky island. So in, in examples of, of two areas where you have that, like the Northern Andes, where you have like this chain of alpine uh, islands and in the Himalaya, not so much the whole Himalaya, but more like the southern, the southern part where you have like these isolated uh, high elevation, um, high elevation habitats that are basically surrounded by lower elevation biomes and of course the the the, the lower lower landscapes. And this this idea of these alpine islands to kind of link back again to to Humboldt he already kind of depicted that you had some kind of ice, like higher elevation area that, that could resemble very much an, an, an island. So this is a very simple example where you kind of have like these, these, these transects through mountains. So you have like here the different, the different mountains and then in red you can see like the transect and then this is the transect over, over space. So if you make like this simple representation as Humboldt did, and it's very easy to, to see how these different mountain shapes actually have within it also like this island island feature in this case like the the higher elevation uh, biome so in this, so the, the the alpine alpine habitat is it started much more like the habitat in in alps uh, not everyone wants to use it for all high elevation habitats in the world but it's an example of how how easily you can see how these features also within mountains can, uh, can become uh, visible. So having that as a kind of example, and then doing it for the Northern Andes, you see, you see the clear isolated 
uh, character that these, in this case, paramos, these Andean high elevation areas have with some large islands and like these, you know, stepping stone islands that are much larger uh, or much further apart. And being in one of those, those, uh, those paramos, you can really see how, it, how a gradient goes into like the forest and then of course the, the lowlands with, with a completely different, uh, different type. So in terms of the parallels between true islands and, uh, and, and, and alpine islands, now that I have a little bit of a better idea what these alpine islands uh, uh, are, is that as you've also already said, of course, it, we've, we perceive something being isolated uh, and it has a certain shape and area that makes it feel like it is uh, very similar or true to, an, uh, to a true island. But something to really link to, uh, to what Sietse was also talking about is that these, the quaternity, the last two, two, six million years, those climate fluctuations have been so substantial and they both influenced true islands and mountain islands or alpine islands substantially. So both of them went through a very dynamic system in that sense. And in, and in both systems, the surface area and connectivity changed radically through time and especially constantly. It was a constant process of change uh, of area and uh, depending on how close islands are together, of course, the connectivity related, uh, related to, the, that, to that as well. So we have the dynamic past of the last, let's say, three million years. And you can basically say that true islands followed a certain pulse. So this pulse was, of course, uh, regulated by the sea level changes. So sea level changes are different in different areas of the world, but let's say that this is like the rough, the rough poles of true islands around the world. So you have, you know, uh, a thousand years, so a hundred thousand years, and basically through time you had a constant change between extremes, but also a lot of fluctuation in between. And, and the, Al the Alpine Islands had a similar, you know, pulse of changes through time, also drastically and also quite rapid in, in some cases. So what, what did this mean for the, the, the islands? We know from talk of pizza that changes could be drastically everywhere. But I wanted to show here some examples and examples I hope that of islands that you know, is that if you look, for example, at, so if we're, if we first gonna see um, that is, if this is the, the curve of the changes through time, then of course you have periods of time that it was extremely cold and those are actually exceptions, as Sitz also said. There are exceptions in time that they were short and they, they occurred very rarely during the last, let's say, million years. Then you had these periods of time that were actually very frequent and also lasted longer. And again, where we are right now, it's again an exception. And where we are, hopefully not yeah, soon, but in the future, is, is again a period where it's, it's extreme. So that where we are right now in this like interglacial phase, that's how we know islands nowadays. But actually many of these islands had completely different configuration the last, well, in, in different periods of time. So in a full glacial period, the inner will would all be connected. Like the islands of the Baleara, like Ibiza, Formentera, they would be just one big chunk of an, of an island. So of course, depending on where, you, where the islands are, they are more or less influenced by, by, the, 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 by the, the, the sea level fluctuations. But this, this, of course, is the way that we should see those, those islands on a, on a longer time scale. And of course, where we're going to head in the future, depending on the temperatures that we're going to control, is that, of course, again, these features of the, of the islands will, uh, will likely change. And a very similar, uh, very similar character we can see in the Alpine Islands. So you had these pulses of temperature going through, 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 going through time. And the Alpine Islands, of course, had some kind of limit where it went, went to another kind of, uh, kind of biome. So you can again see that, that the glacial periods, the full ice age periods, were, were very, just very rare in, in time. And that these intermediate periods where it wasn't too cold, too cool, too warm, or cooler than today, that, that, that was actually the norm. 
And then you can see a very similar pattern uh, uh, actually. So this is an, an example of the Eastern Cordillera. So this is where, how it kind of looks like right now, Eastern Cordillera of Colombia, Sierra Nevada, Colombia, the Alps and the East African Rift. So you see that actually most of the, the time there were the, the paramos were much bigger. Uh, the, the habitat alpine system of course was much bigger and also the East African Rift, but they are still very isolated. And of course, when you go deeper in time, in the case of the Alps, the glacier extent was so big that all these habitats were pushed to the, to the side. But this is actually the norm. Where we are right now is, is the exception. But that, that is the way that we have to understand these systems, that how, how, how much they've been changing and how different they've been most of the time compared to what we see right now. So just thinking about islands and comparing island systems in mountains, that goes back a long time. So we've got uh, Simpson in 74, and she actually made a very simple comparison between uh, the Galapagos and these alpine island systems in, uh, in the Andes. And the first thing that she said is, well, actually looking into the analysis, the floors of the high North uh, Andean islands and the Galapagos, show that plant species diversity conforms to the MacArthur, MacArthur and Wilson model of island biogeography. So at that moment, she already said like these alpine systems, they, they behave as islands. They, they fulfill the expectations that we would have uh, looking at normal, at, at true islands. And besides that, she also said, well, if I look into the plant species diversity, it's actually more significantly correlated with the area and this is message of the glacial forms. And what does he mean with the glacial form? So you have these, the darker, that is what it is right now. And like this dashed line, that's, where, that's what it was during, during the glacial period. So she said, well, actually to understand the diversity right now, it doesn't make sense to, to look at the, what the area is right now. You have to look at how the area was during the most cold period or the mo most period of the, of the time in, in the past. So this is the kind of thinking that, that, that covers much of the legacy thinking of the past that is, that is important for us to do. Um, so these two sentences basically made up her, her abstract, uh, which is much uh, more easier than what you normally have to do for science uh, nowadays, but it's a very nice, uh, it's a great paper as, uh, as, uh, as true uh, innovative thinking. So in terms of the flickering connectivity system and now really getting into how what it means to be such a dynamic uh, system. So one way that we can think about this pulsing system through time is through these maps. But of course, as we've seen from, from Max as well, from Max as well, is that showing it something visually is, is a very strong way to understand. So of course, we can understand much from seeing how it was in like a, a snapshot but it represents very little of, of everything that we've been going through as a, as a, as a globe, as, a, as the Earth uh, actually. So um, last year I published with Aaron and collaborators this uh, paper in Journal by Geography and it's called the Flickering Connectivity System of the North Andean Paramos. And in, in parallel with Catalina Giraldo, we developed a movie to explain it because we actually noticed how difficult it was to, to, to describe to people what it means to be such a dynamic dynamic system. So of course, uh, I wanna show you very, uh, it's like a two minute thing. I just wanna show very, very briefly about what it, what it actually is a system that goes so dynamically through, uh, through the quaternity. So give me a message if you don't hear the sound. Scientists have discovered that during the last two million years, cold and warm periods of climate caused the Paramo to migrate upwards and downwards hundreds of times, especially during the last million years. These changes could even have been so much as 1500 vertical meters. When climate was warming, the Paramos moved upwards and its distribution broke into isolated fragments. But when climate cooled, the Paramo moved downslope and the topography of the mountain offered much more space for connections. Interestingly, 
These cold and warm conditions were distributed unevenly in time. These scientists discovered that during the last two million years, the period of the Pleistocene ice ages, warm global temperatures like today, only took about 20% of the time, while cold and cool conditions dominated for over 80% of the time. As a result, the Paramos were often much larger than what we see in the present, and the populations of plants were much more connected. This long dance of connectivity and disconnection is an important mechanism, which we call the flickering connectivity system. Okay, I'll start right here. So this is, as you can see, like a 30 minute, uh, a 30 minute uh, video where we go basically through the history and what the possible evolutionary consequences are of, this, of these changes, even if it's a very simple, simple model. Um, but um, it, it comes with, uh, with the supplementary information of, of this paper because we, we felt that that was the, 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 the strongest way to show what, what we wanted to, to show from this system. So basically what we did is that if you have here these, uh, these, Andes, these Andes areas, we kind of separated the different mountain, the mountains of uh, the Northern Andes in like separate mountain, mountain ranges. And we, and we decided to quantify the degree of connectivity of these alpine islands through time. So what we did here is basically look into, if you have here those different mountain areas, and then quantify the, the paramo at different moments in time. So here's again, is the thousand years. So the record that we're using, the paleo record is a million years. So what you see here very, very clearly is that, is that the different paramo in the different mountain areas, they all were, were very dynamic, but they, they went through a very, very, very different dynamic past. So that shows that even if, they're, if, if we can see them as mountain or, or island systems, uh, going through the past actually shows again how different they have been and of course the teasing question is how much has this influenced uh, the, the patterns of endemism and biodiversity and species richness that we see that we see today. So where next in this alpine island and true island comparison? So what I think is that based on what we see today so we have this legacy effect of, of systems that have been constantly changing in terms of isolation and, and connectivity with the work of, of seats, of course, that can be done for different systems uh, of true islands around the world. But these kind of visualizations like Max has been doing are very powerful to kind of zoom in to an area where, for example, phylogenetic data is available or any kind of human influence data or extinction data, because then we can really relate between what has happened in the past and what's now. And the reason why zooming in is so important is because systems, because of their topography, they will have behaved very differently. So making global models will kind of lose the effect of these, these local patterns. But as of course, Juve also said, well, we can compare the different islands and mountain islands when, when we see systems that might be alike, but of course it's important to choose uh, wisely. We see all these island-like systems around the world, but a uh, very crude comparison might, might push us towards the, the, the wrong conclusions. So that said, uh, thank you again very much for joining uh, today's session. I know it's been very long and we're running over time. Uh, but thanks a lot for uh, for joining, and I hope you will have some uh, some questions. Thanks, Suzette. Do you mind if I uh, take the questions? No, go ahead. There's a we have a couple of questions. So we have someone with their hand up, and we have three currently open questions. Um, so the first question comes from Karina, and sh she asks, "Do you think that the climate changes that are occurring?" today presumably could change the condition of island-like systems on top of mountains. I consider these areas to be ecological environments for animals with preferences for low temperature and low competition environments. Yeah, thanks Karin, that's a very good, uh, that's a very good question. Um, of course, how do they, the climate change will 
will change the condition of these eigenlike systems. Many models uh, only looking into the present will say, well, you know, the, 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 the isolation feature will become even more severe, especially when things warm, where are these alpine taxa species going through, right? So something interesting to think about is that we have the paleo record that even in very warm periods in, in, of the past, we see that these paramos have been very restricted, but we don't at this moment see massive extinctions as many ecological models uh, predict. So does that mean that our limits between biomes are not so strict as, the, as many taxa perceive them? Uh, or is there a certain climatic niche that many of these high elevation taxa are able to uh, able to cope with, but we're not currently seeing it. So of course, uh, we expect, we think that the climate warming will make isolation even higher for those alpine systems, but the consequences, that's still up much for discussion, I think. Thanks for your question and thanks Suzette for the answer. The next question comes from Richard Field and this is a question that I was actually interested in. Um, Richard asks, although it is of course important to recognize that the current and the late glacial maximum are extremes and not the norm in the quaternary, is there an argument that the extremes are actually key because they represent the least and the most connectivity respectively? And essentially saying that you know, those extremes are actually important when you think about biological processes. Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Richard. Um, so the thing is that we, we kind of assume that the highest isolation is, of course, in those features, but, or in that, those kind of extremes. But, we, but with the very complex topography, uh, high isolation of high connectivity could have been occurring much, much earlier, and that we don't necessarily have that extreme. The thing is that what I see in a lot of papers is that because many of the paleoclimate uh, data that we see focus on extreme, the last interglacial, the last, the last glacial, the last interglacial, last glacial, and then people relate their biodiversity data with those two extremes saying the most biodiversity we get from these extremes. And that's why I say, no, what you, you see this legacy effect. And of course, those, those extremes should have left some kind of high gene flow or very low gene flow, um, but it doesn't explain the full build up of biodiversity. So yes, they have been extreme, but people should kind of leverage their words a little bit in saying that the last glacial maximum explains it all just because we can quantify how you know uh, models may look in the last glacial maximum. So it's a more in terms of wording where I say, look at the whole perspective and don't blame it all on the extremes. Thanks, Richard, for the question, and thanks, Suzette. Our next question comes from Marcos Dantosqueros, who asks, before your article, I've always heard about species pump phenomena to explain the evolutionary dynamics of mountain species. Do you think there is an overlap of concepts in the two ideas? Yes, 100%. Uh, the thing is that I've, I've had in mind to write an article about the how the concept of the species pump evolved because it's a concept that through time has been using it has been used for different systems and sometimes it got invalidated for certain systems and then people thought oh the species pump concept it doesn't apply anymore but it's actually very interesting to see that it applies for certain uh, uh, systems and I kind of vote for the alpine system of the Andes that it's a very good example of a very possible strong species pump but it has been also used for systems on, on lowlands, on between the tropics and the temperate. So that concept, it's not so clear anymore what, what is, yeah, where it has been validated and where it became like confusing. So um, that's actually something on my to-do list. <laughs> Thanks, and we have two more questions and I think that's about it. One written question comes from Yago who asks, do you think that climate changes alone can predict range expansion of montane vegetation or other factors such as edaphic aspects and ecophysiological limitations should also be taken into account? 
Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Of course, you have factors that all kind of work on different scales. So of course you have a driver like the climate that will enforce some initial changes that might be might be changing a system towards a certain, let's say, tipping point. But of course, you have the interaction between taxa, you have the dependencies between taxa, you have certain soils where you know, some island systems were, or, or habitats are not going to be able to shape. So I think that the, the, on the scale that we're looking at, we will have the climate as like a main, like top, like the top factor. But as lo when you start zooming in, like the work of Max, then, you know, can we include some kind of erosion, some kind of soil adaptive uh, characteristics? And then, of course, when you really focus on a specific taxa or group, the more you know about what it likes and it doesn't like, uh, then the better your models are going to be, of course. Okay, so on to our final question, which is a calling in question. It's like the radio, isn't it? Um, so this comes from Darko Kotoras, who I believe should be able to speak. Darko, can you, can you? Yes. Great, thank you. Go ahead. So it, you show that the paramos. Your call uh, is being recorded. Okay. You, you, you show that the paramos today are smaller than what they have been for most of their history. So, my question is for species area curves, do you see an overestimation of the species richness for the paramos, which can be explained because today they are exceptionally small? Brilliant question. That's true. Yeah, and that's something, looking through the literature, that's something I've seen for butterflies, for birds, and for plants, that some small paramo, paramos, they have a higher, the much higher species richness than they're supposed to have based on the area that we see nowadays. So having some kind of review of actually, of actually combining that evidence of and birds and butterflies and plants and that is actually not something only you see in the end. It's, there are different mountains in the world where I picked up on some paper where they said, this, this, this part over here, it has much higher than we would expect uh, based on the, 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 the area uh, species relationship. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Good, thanks. Great, thank you for your question. Uh, I think that's it. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers today. Thanks, Suzette, for a great talk, finishing off there. Uh, I think we have um, uh, um, someone from the society that wants to uh, mention a couple of things before, Suzette, you wrap up, okay? Thanks, Aaron. So I think this is my turn. So my name is Crystal McMichael, and I'm the vice president of conferences for the International Biogeography Society. And we would like to thank all of the participants for showing up. It's incredible how much turnout that we've got. And the speakers today have been fantastic. So special thanks to all four speakers. And from the University of Amsterdam, I'm super proud to have two of these speakers, alums of University of Amsterdam. And for Suzette Flantua, who I've worked with for several years, Thank you so much for hosting not only this event, but multiple events during this Humboldt Day series. It's been absolutely fantastic. So the Biogeography Society thanks all of you tremendously. And this is gonna lead into an ongoing seminar series where we ask biogeographers and ecologists to come and talk about potentially hot topics in biogeography and ecology. So I hope that we can continue this. And Miguel Matias is our bio, um, Biogeography Society member who put all of this together, all of these Humboldt events. So thanks a lot, Miguel. It's been fantastic. Thanks. Thank thanks. you, Crystal. Suzette, yeah. do you want to finish off with a couple of words? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the people probably see it, but uh, anything that you might have missed or want to reach out to us specifically, uh, either find us, we have very simple Twitter names or uh, anything specific that you want to ask. We're really open to hear any more questions you, you might have tomorrow morning. Uh, please reach out and if you have any further comments or if you need any paper, then we're really happy. So um, I think it was a really good, good session and uh, I feel that there, there definitely were at, at the moment that those kind of island-like systems need more comparison and uh, and we're at a very good moment to to start such like development so thanks a lot for for everyone that stayed with us so long <laughs>
Thanks, uh, Aaron, for accepting uh, to host the session today and yesterday. Um, and, uh, and for those around uh, tomorrow, uh, the University of Bergen with uh, John Burks and, uh, and uh, Vigdis will have uh, another session that, uh, that really links to Humboldt. So thanks a lot for everyone, uh, to everyone, and, uh, and hopefully uh, with Crystal's uh, permission, maybe another talk in the future. <laughs>